Hello on person, this is Anton and today we're going to discuss some of the recent studies on the idea behind Dyson spheres, or essentially this hypothetical structure that one day humans might be able to create, or maybe some kind of a type 2 civilization has already created somewhere in the galaxy. With the main purpose being capturing as much energy as possible from the star in order to basically power the civilization. The concept that was explored and analyzed by Freeman Dyson in his 1960 paper searched for artificial stellar sources of infrared radiation, but technically originally proposed by this person, Olaf Stapledon, a British science fiction writer who came up with this concept back in the 1930s. And here this would essentially be a kind of a ultimate astro-engineering goal for a typical civilization that's about to reach its energy limits and is unable to generate enough energy on the planet itself. With the assumption being that some kind of an advanced alien civilization might require so much energy that they have to create something like this in order to continue advancing. But the obvious question here is how and exactly what effect this would have on the rest of the star system, or of course if it's even possible. Well, in some of these recent studies, quite a few of these questions actually get answered. With the first question being, can we actually form the Dyson Sphere itself, or do we have to rely on the concept known as the Dyson Swarm? Now this is of course a Dyson Swarm, or basically lots of different satellites orbiting the star, capturing energy individually, but the original concept was basically a kind of a shell around the star in order to capture as much as possible. But the problem here was that a sphere, or even a ring, would extremely likely fall apart, because any rigid sphere would be just not strong enough to withstand gravity. And so in one of the recent studies, scientists actually explore the possibility of possibly making these rigid spheres in certain gravitational conditions. And so here, a study by Colin McInnes explores the idea of ring worlds and Dyson spheres by assuming that it's possible to create them in various gravitational points of stability. Now in the solar system, we usually refer to these as the Lagrange points, but the thing is it's possible to create additional gravitational points of stability in more complex systems. And so, for example, in a binary system, especially where the mass ratio between two objects is relatively small, it becomes possible to create additional points where technically placing a sphere or placing a ring around a star might not actually break it. And so, in essence here, this study provides several solutions by examining the idea behind the three-body problem. Discovering various configurations where it's possible to have a stable sphere or a stable ring, but in extremely specific conditions. With one potential solution basically being a Dyson sphere around a smaller star in a stable binary system, which will apparently provide enough stability because of the formation of these Lagrange points between the stars. And so essentially here we have a somewhat intriguing mathematical resolution to the problem of Dyson sphere stability. But the next study is even more exciting because that study goes in way more detail and actually explains exactly what would happen to planet Earth and the conditions on the planet if one day humanity decided to build one of these structures right here in the solar system. And so here a study by Ian Marius Peters on the photovoltaic Dyson sphere goes into a lot of detail, examining everything from the amount of stuff required to build the structure to the amount of excess heat it generates, which will actually then affect various planets. But here once again the focus is on Dyson Swarm. Mostly because this is the only stable configuration in the solar system that can technically survive long term and thus generate extra energy. But the first question is, so exactly how do we actually collect this energy and exactly what are these individual Dyson collectors? Well here the assumption is that this is based on the photovoltaic technology, basically a solar panel. But in order to make this functional and actually work, or basically in order to convert stellar radiation into energy, and to make this efficient enough, we need to have an extremely efficient temperature control. Mostly because solar panels only function in extremely specific temperatures, and usually lose their efficiency if it's too cold or too hot. And so to make this super efficient, here there has to be a thermal exchange balance, very likely requiring these structures to contain a large surface area. Basically in order to release a lot of extra heat, as the heat from the sun is absorbed by the solar panels, with the temperature regulation of each of these structures basically being one of the main challenges. And so in essence each of these would be a kind of a satellite able to absorb energy from the sun and then able to retransmit this energy somewhere else where this energy is required. And because each of them represents a kind of a spaceship, 
In theory, they could all be launched individually and actually represent a very intriguing way of generating energy depending on the needs. Basically here the project would grow incrementally as more and more energy is required by the civilization. But apparently they cannot be too small, because anything that's too small is going to become way too hot, way too fast, and thus lose efficiency or become completely impractical. And so these spheres do have to be relatively large, possibly resembling some kind of a large satellite. In this study the assumption is that these satellites could be launched using modern rockets. But they cannot be as small as a typical CubeSat, because unfortunately these are just not going to be efficient enough. But because each of these satellites has to maintain its own temperature and is also re-emitting a lot of energy as the infrared to maintain stability, this actually has a dramatic effect on all of the planets. Because apparently if we have this large Dyson swarm around the sun made up of these individual satellites, they would affect planets radiative balance so much that they can actually increase Earth's temperature by at least 140 Kelvin if they are anywhere close to planet Earth. In other words, if we actually decide to place these in the same orbit as our own planet for efficiency of energy transfer, they can potentially make the planet completely uninhabitable because of this tremendous increase of radiation coming from each of these satellites, which would then dramatically heat up the planet. And that's something that was never really considered before or has never really been explored in this way. Because here the implication is that a Dyson swarm will dramatically shift the temperature balance in the entire star system, moving the entire habitable zone into a different location. Which hypothetically speaking would also create an intriguing way to terraform various planets. For example by having this in the solar system, assuming Earth is no longer habitable, we can actually shift the habitable zone toward Mars and even use the tremendous energy generated by the swarm to terraform Mars even further. And in theory, a large enough Dyson swarm can actually harvest up to 4% of solar energy, which is a ridiculous amount of power. This would be equivalent to about 15.6 yottawatt of power, which is about trillion times higher than the entire planet Earth currently consumes every single year. The global energy consumption is approximately 15 terawatts annually. Or just to give you some other examples, this is enough energy to completely vaporize Martian carbon dioxide polar caps in just a tiny fraction of a second. Or enough energy to propel an interstellar spacecraft to almost the speed of light in once again just a fraction of a second. But because this is such a tremendous amount of energy, it's really this excess heat that then becomes a bit of a problem. But the researcher in this paper discovered the best possible location for these panels, or basically the best possible solution. At an approximate distance of 2.13 astronomical units away from the Sun, or basically between planet Mars and the asteroid belt, a partial Dyson sphere covering approximately 22% of the entire sphere's surface would only increase the temperature on Earth by about 3 Kelvin but would also actually make Mars much warmer as well. In other words, even here in the solar system, it might be possible to generate an enormous amount of energy using Dyson Swarm without causing the planet to overheat, while also making Mars just a little bit more habitable as well. But then there's a question of how do you even make this stuff? As a matter of fact, it does require a tremendous amount of material. Because here the additional calculation suggests we need approximately 1.3 times 10 to the power of 23 kilograms of silicon. And though it might not mean much, it's basically just as much silicon as the entire planet Mars seems to contain. And though planet Earth might contain 6 times more silicon, most of it is very difficult to extract, with the moon containing approximately 9 times less than we need in total. And so in theory, if we somehow break Mars and turn it into this Dyson sphere, it might actually give us enough material to produce these panels. But obviously here we're losing a planet, with the actual engineering involved also being beyond our capabilities. And though it's maybe possible to extract this from somewhere else, for example the asteroid belt or some of the other objects, there we just don't have enough silicon to create the swarm. But obviously here this is based on the modern photovoltaic technology requiring silicon. And we know that there's a lot of research on, for example, carbon-based photovoltaics, which might be just as efficient in a few years. And so if we use carbon to create this, there might be enough in the asteroid belt after all. But because here we're talking about planetary scale mining involving massive amounts of material, this is still obviously just a little bit beyond our capabilities. Because here you're essentially talking about converting something very similar in mass to Ganymede into individual tiny objects orbiting the Sun. And that's just not something we know how to do yet at all. 
Nevertheless, the analysis and the discovery from the study is still kind of intriguing. First of all, it implies that any kind of a Dyson swarm will dramatically shift the thermal balance in the entire star system, and it will definitely relocate the habitable zone, basically changing the climate on every single planet in the star system as well. And so for some star systems, this might be actually a great solution. You obviously get energy, and you also get much warmer climate. But this would still require quite an impressive engineering feat, and basically the ability to create billions of tiny satellites in orbit around a star. And chances are that an advanced civilization might have actually figured out how to create energy in a much simpler and more efficient way. And so since, as of 2025, we still haven't found any of these Dyson Swarms or Dyson Spheres anywhere in the galaxy, except for those few candidates we discussed previously in the video in the description, all of this just might mean that maybe Dyson Swarms and Dyson Spheres are just not required, and there are maybe much easier ways to generate a lot of energy without the use of these massive structures. But these other ideas and other methods we'll discuss in some other videos in the future. And so until those videos, check out some of the previous videos on the Fermi Paradox and the ideas behind advanced extraterrestrial intelligence in some of the links in the description. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.